Joining me live is Professor Peter Matthews, uh, Professor rather, of Political Science in Cypress College, LA. Thank you for joining us, Professor. Uh, two new orders that we've just heard signed today. No honeymoon period for the 46th president. Uh, we just heard that uh, it's going to be primarily science-based. Absolutely, and that was a big theme of the campaign, science and reason, not a bunch of uh, guesswork and uh, ideologically biased judgments. No, we have to get to the bottom of this, and Joe Biden was very clear about that in his speech, his inaugural speech, as well as what he's been doing with the executive orders and putting through legislation through Congress that'll attack this in a scientific way. It's a horrible tragedy. Over 400,000 people have died here in America, which, as you said earlier in your report, is more than World War II uh, death victims. He's also not wasting any time in terms of impeachment. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced today the House of Representatives will formally send the article of impeachment against Trump to the Senate next week. The trial uh, set to begin Tuesday, your time. Schumer also mentioned some of his Republican colleagues are certainly in disagreements about the trial being unconstitutional because Donald Trump is no longer in office. What do you make of the argument? There's no basis of that argument in the Constitution. The Constitution says nothing about when the trial can occur. It says it'll occur after the actual impeachment, which took place in the House. Now the trial comes to the Senate. It doesn't say that the president has to be in office to be tried because he committed those uh, egregious acts while he was in office. It doesn't matter if he left office or not. So I think that the, the Senate, that Schumer is correct, and the Senate will proceed in the trial process. Professor, what do you think uh, some of Donald Trump's achievements were when in office? Operation Warp Speed in terms of its name, in terms of its, and it did in fact get the vaccine going within a year of the actual pandemic onslaught. So that was pretty remarkable. He did use resources. He got contracted billions of dollars worth of vaccine contracts with big pharmaceutical companies to, to actually come up with it. And so the research was done quite quickly. And so was the testing. I think those were achievements of his, but then there was no extra vaccines left. So there was a really big problem there with honesty and truth as well. But that was an achievement, getting the vaccine in, you know, available uh, at least by the end of December. Donald Trump in his final speech also mentioned uh, in terms of taxes uh, to the opposition, I hope they don't raise your taxes. If they do, I told you so. Let's take a listen and get your reaction. We also got tax cuts, the largest tax cut and reform in the history of our country by far. I hope they don't raise your taxes. But if they do, I told you so. What do you make of that speech, Professor? Well, it, he did, in fact, cut taxes through the help of Congress to the tune of $1.5 trillion. And that's a lot of money to give mostly to the upper class. In fact, 84% of those tax cuts went to the top 1% of the population. And that's the problem. The tax cuts should have been targeted much more toward working people and the poor who could actually go out and spend it and create demand in the economy. With the old supply side trickle down economics theory, which he put into practice, it hasn't helped grow the economy at all. In fact, it's left us with more unemployment, and I believe it was the wrong kind of tax cut. He's right about it. He gave a tax cut mostly to the rich people. The inauguration of Joe Biden took place uh, this week. It's extremely a tight security, and as part of uh, President Joe Biden's speech, he gave a firm warning to his staff at the White House. Let's take a listen. But I'm not joking when I say this. If you're ever working with me and I hear you treat another colleague with disrespect, talk down to someone, I promise you I will fire you on the spot. On the spot. No ifs, ands, or buts. Everybody, everybody is entitled to be treated with decency and dignity. That's been missing in a big way the last four years. How important, Peter, do you think uh, decency and honesty is for this office as Joe Biden is leader? Absolutely important and imperative, and Joe Biden epitomizes that. Actually, when he, if you look at his, has his background, his faith-based background, his politics, uh, he was he's an American Catholic uh, Christian, and he's the second Catholic in our history after President Kennedy. And Joe Biden goes by the doctrine of helping your fellow human being, of being your sister's and brother's keeper, and walking a mile in the other person's shoes. All this comes from the Catholic doctrine of faith without works is dead. So Biden wants to, he's very, faith, you know, he goes to mass, not only that, but he believes in those issues that inform his politics. That's why he believes that we should have these kinds of help for the less fortunate people, those who are on the, the underdog in society, and those what is, is a lot of his issues are targeted toward, based a lot on his Catholic philosophy and doctrine. So I think dignity is a big part of that, believing that there's a spark of the divine in each of us, 
and that we belong to the same human family. So he's saying to his people that, that, who work for him, you better treat each other just the way you're supposed to treat each other, morally speaking, ethically speaking. I think it's wonderful. In your opinion, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump and many of these uh, voters are extremely loyal. What do you think Joe Biden needs to do to win over these voters? Yes, he needs to reach out to their humanity and their concept of belonging to the same American family. And it's going to be very tough because many of the Donald Trump supporters are very hardcore in terms of support for him based on quite often misinformation that they have. And that's been a real problem. Disinformation, misinformation about the reality of life. And they've, they've basically bought it hook, line and sinker and they're based on that. And all that, Donald, that uh, President Biden can do is to reach out to them and say, look, let's please move forward with unity along common issues and ideas such as jobs, healthcare, education, the climate change issue, uh, gender equi equality. Those things can be common factors for all Americans if it's, if it's done in an inspirational way. And I think Biden can probably do that to some extent. He won't win all of them over. And what do you think some of the biggest challenges are for the Republican Party to rebuild? A big challenge is how to keep the party from fracturing because I think Donald Trump has been has accomplished that horrible situation for them, and that is by in, inciting the insurrection on January the 6th and having all those people go in and take over the Congress and try to stop the vote count. All of that was a complete disservice to the American Constitution, and it divided the Republican Party because some of them, about 48% say this was wrong. They support the rule of law. They are Republicans in the traditional sense who want to keep democracy going. Others, over 40%, are hardcore Trump supporters who believe that the president was right in what he did and that the, the vote should have been stopped, the vote count, because the vote was stolen. And this is complete misinformation that they're laboring under. So it's a very tough situation for the Republican Party to rebuild, but I think they probably can do it. It's going to take a lot of hard work, though, and time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as we mentioned before, the executive orders are being signed. There's so much work being done straight away with no honeymoon period. One of those executive orders included the reinstatement of uh, the US to the Paris Climate Agreement. Very controversial, that issue. What kind of a reaction are you hearing in the US and from other leaders overseas? Well, most of the leaders here support it, as do most of the population. And um, people overseas, the leaders overseas definitely support it. I'll put this number. The Pew Research Center did a survey recently, and 92% of Americans believe that climate change is one of the top issues that should be addressed. And so the vast majority do support entering the climate accord, once again, to make sure everything's equitable, of course, for all the countries to share the burden of it, or reducing greenhouse gases. But it has to be done because we are so far beyond the pale right now when it comes to ensuring that the next generation will have a safe climate to live in. So I think it's a very good thing. Most Americans agree with that, I think. Professor Peter Matthews, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.